Hey everybody, Tom Gentile here. Welcome to our Profit Strategies podcast for week ending January 12th, 2024. All right, got that timestamp done. What are we going to talk about this week? Uh, we got to talk about Bitcoin. We got to talk about Bitcoin. Um, there's two things that are not being said about what happened about the SEC approving Bitcoin ETFs. I will cover both of those. I got to write this down to make sure that I do cover both of these. Let me see where I can put this. Right in... Here we go. All right, there. Make sure I cover that. Uh, you know, you get to be my age when you want to cover something. You better write it down or you're going to forget it. Uh, what else have I got going on? You know what? I want to talk about the sacrifices that we make to be successful traders. And then finally, you know, we had another storm. We had, well, another storm. We had the first big storm of 2024 that came through. Uh, I believe it was called Finn. Now, I have a buddy of mine has a dog named Finn. But this dog, it came to hunt. And so um, I was prepping. And I want to talk about prepping for a storm. And what that's got to do with the markets, prepping for a financial storm, and, you know, you saw a little bit of that kind of happening here toward the end of the week where the markets are, you know, this is this is January. And January, you know, um, I'm, I might have said it last week. I don't know. You know, that whole so goes the first week of January, so goes the month, and then so goes the month, so goes the year. These are patterns. And so January has become one of those um, one of those months. Uh, that's gotten quite volatile. It's actually a volatile month. And so that's what we're starting to see. We're starting to see the markets not go up in January so much. Now here, look, I say this and then the, the rest of January, <laughs> we might go sky high. But, uh, you know, these are these are things that that you learn and you get as experience. And and so I want to talk about those three things today. That's the three things I'm going to cover in today's podcast. We'll talk about Bitcoin We'll talk about, um, you know, what I think uh, you, especially those that are new, that are new, new to trading. And to me, you know, you know who a new trader is? Someone that's been doing this for five years or less. You know, you might say, well, I've been trading for five years, Tom. I, you know what? Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you were trading for five years, uh, congratulations. First, because you, you, you made it through 2020. Right. That that whole pandemic, that was a mess. Anybody that got along before the pandemic, you know, uh, God bless you if you're still here. Um, if you went through the 2022 meme, you know, where, where 2021, 2022, uh, everybody who decided to become a new trader wanted to trade one of three things. GameStop, AMC or Bed Bath and Behind. And, you know, if you're still here, God bless you. You made it. Welcome. Welcome to the club. You know what the club I'm talking about is? The club of you got your knees chopped off and you're still here club. Um, that's that's how I got indoctrinated into this business. I got started in, uh, in, in 1986 and I suffered through the, uh, the, the, the crash of 87, right? And then I took a year off. I had to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. And that was really where I got started in trading. I don't consider what I did in 86 and 87 to be trading. I consider that to be something close to Atlantic City. <clears throat> and if you were a meme trader, you probably fall into that same category. All right. So uh, so that's, you know, that's really what I want to get into. And <clears throat> we'll talk about sacrifice. We'll talk about prepping for a storm, and I'm going to be using the VIX. But first thing I want to cover here today as we get into our podcast is Bitcoin. And so you know what I'm doing? I'm logging in to my Coinbase. I'm logging in. I'm looking at things. And uh, and, and by the way, you know, uh, you know, as I'm looking at the, the, um, the markets and I'm looking at what's going on, um, it's, it's funny. Everybody thought 
when the SEC was going to announce, when the SEC was going to announce this, uh, the, the, the approval of ETFs, everyone thought, that I mean, I was I was hearing that we were going to make uh, that the Bitcoin was going to go to a million dollars a coin. These are the these are the, the outliers saying this. Bitcoin's going to go to a million dollars a coin. Bitcoin's going to go to half a million dollars a coin. That was the conservative outlier. In by the end of the week, <clears throat> nope, not going to happen. Now, I, I I'm going to mention this. All right, so about five years ago, no, 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 about four years ago, yeah. Four years ago, three to four years ago, I made a call on Bitcoin myself. And I said that I believe that Bitcoin will be half a million dollars a coin. But I said that 2030 was my target. Okay, now at the time, Bitcoin was trading. Uh, I mean, it was trading somewhere close to where we were right now. And I said, you know what? I can put a 10x on this. Uh, and, and I can make th this could be a four or five hundred thousand dollar coin. And I chose five hundred thousand because it's a round number um, and twenty thirty. And the reason why I chose twenty thirty wasn't because I was thinking it was going to be there, but I had some pretty good research behind the fact. And the research behind that fact had to do with cycles. It had to do with halving. All right. Um, and it had to do with just just looking at time and looking at time and looking at um at, at that that compound move with bitcoin but you know let me get into the first problem i have with what happened this week you know for you know you've got you've got yeah you got the youtubers out there who are saying oh it's gonna it's gonna go to a million dollars by next week i mean you know First of all, guys, ask yourselves this question. Where do you get your financial news? Where do you get your financial news? You know, I mean, I myself too. Well, um, Bloomberg. Yeah, Bloomberg is a good place to get it. In fact, the Bloomberg terminal, I had that for several years. And, uh, you know, and, and I just found that I wasn't using it. You know, this was... This thing was costing me, I don't know, $3,000 a month. And I wasn't using it for, for everything I could get out of it. Because at the end of the day, and most of you know me, you know, I'm not a day trader. All right. I am in the area, I think the minimum amount of trade, and not, not all the time, I'm talking average. My average trade minimum is probably going to be somewhere around 30 days. So I'm a 30-day or longer trader. I'm what you call a position trader. Um, so the, you know, looking at that, um, Bloomberg was, is really one of those breaking news. You know, you can, you can get a lot out of that service. I just wasn't using it to the capacity that a professional prop trader could use. The other thing too, is I'm an option trader. I have my own software and honestly, I think the stuff that I created, and this is a biased opinion. So, you know, it, it bears to be. Uh, debated. <clears throat> I think that the stuff that I have is better than Bloomberg, right? Because Bloomberg is kind of the jack of all trades for that the financial trader, where the stuff that I use, and you can see it in the links, the stuff that I use is just options. It's really specific because, you know, that's, a, that's my sandbox. That's the sandbox I go to as a trader. As an investor, I'm not an options trader. All right, as an investor, I trade stocks. I trade. I have private. Uh, uh, you know, I'm in the private area. Um, I have bonds. I have real estate. I have precious metals. I have, and I have Bitcoin as well. But back to the question: Where do you get your financial news? All right. <clears throat> well. It's, it's really, you know, you think about this, we are trusting, uh, you know, as investors and as traders, we trust our news sources. But apparently, where are our news sources getting their financial news? Apparently, it must be Twitter slash X, because Tuesday, you know, 
not that not that far ago. Earlier this week, Tuesday around 4:30, CNBC, I said it, <laughs> breaks news about Bitcoin ETF being cleared by the SEC. It took them 10 minutes to figure out that the SEC Twitter account, which by the way, that was that was the, that was the only piece of news they got that from and they broke that on the air. And so if um if you were to look at and I'm I'm trying to find it here real quick. Okay, so here we go. So if you look at Tuesday's data, and I'm looking at Tuesday's data. Tuesday's data, if you look at a candle on, on Bitcoin, and I know you don't see me, you can only hear me on this audio podcast, but so I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna work it out for you. So we were around 47,000 when that news broke. And by the end of the day, we were we were trading at 46 because you know what happened? They broke the news about the Bitcoin ETF being cleared by the SEC only to have to retract it about 10 minutes later. Took them 10 minutes to figure out. And, you know, what happened was the SEC. All right. Uh, the president of the SEC had to come out on his Twitter form and say, no, our uh, our Twitter account had been compromised. So, you know, I mean, we could talk about the fact that that, yeah, some, you know, some hacker made a little bit, well, made some money because but not as much as they thought they were going to make. Because, you know, at, when that news became announced, I mean, we went up to maybe almost 48 before dropping. That was one of the smallest moves on something uh, that was supposedly breaking news of anything I've seen. I mean, I've seen stocks get a big, bigger move up only to find out that that new that the news was not correct and come screaming back down. Bitcoin barely moved. Now, a couple of thoughts run through my head. Number one, the hacker, whoever hacked into X slash Twitter to post that information, to hack the SEC website, they didn't make as much as they thought they were going to make. All right. Because it barely moved. Um, so, you know, uh, th that's good. Um, and I'll come back around to to um, to Bitcoin in a moment. But here's the big thing that I found interesting. CNBC, instead of coming out and apologizing, you know, and saying, you know what, we screwed up because here's the truth. They screwed up. They took I mean, my God, how many times have we seen information come out on Twitter that was false? How many names of dead celebrities have we heard about only to find out a little bit later from that celebrity that they were still alive and well? How, you know, you think about this. These guys are taking the, 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 the very thing they loathe. A lot of these, the, these, um, these companies out here, the, the mainstream media, loathe Twitter and X. They, they took Elon Musk to the to the uh, woodshed and beat him, <laughs> and yet they still use uh, they still use Twitter, which is social media, not main, not not supposedly the media that we get our news from. Social media. They took it as news. They published it, and then ten minutes later had to backtrack. You know how they backtracked? They spun it. They didn't say we apologize. We should have looked at, at, uh, at an SEC website. We should have verified this information instead of taking a tweet. Instead, they said, how could they? How could they have had their account hacked? It's Elon Musk's fault. <laughs> Unbelievable. No, you douchebags. It's your fault for not verifying the source. It's your fault by not going out and looking at the SEC website and refreshing that thing a few times. To find out that that was really the case, because if it was really the case, the SEC would have posted it on the website before putting it on the, their Twitter slash X account. I'm going to call it Twitter for a while, guys, because X is a, is weird. <laughs> I mean, it is it is to me. You know, I mean, why? Why didn't they double and triple check? Oh, you you can bet they're going to do it now. Some heads are rolling. At CNBC for that one, um, you know it's it's funny because uh, you know I listen to um, and and this folks is the why is why this is why I don't all right I, I this is why I mute 
I mute mainstream media. I have the TV on. I have it on as low as I possibly can because I don't want it to distract me as a trader. Okay, I don't want it to distract me as a trader. So, and you wonder why people don't trust mainstream media. So, you know, here's another thought I had. How many YouTubers out there, because these guys are just as bad, how many YouTube sensations already, <clears throat> already, because, you know, in order to, to make the most money on clicks on YouTube, you got to be the first, one of the first ones out there. How many YouTubers do you think already had videos created that said, okay, the e SEC is cleared, has cleared e Bitcoin ETFs. What happens next? And then they had the same video. Okay, the SEC denied you, uh, the, the request for Bitcoin ETFs. They already had both videos. Please, someone tell me. I mean, I can't be the only one thinking this. How many of these guys out there had both videos ready to go? And as soon as that, that came out, they went ahead and took the one that was the right one and uploaded it as fast as they could. <laughs> I got to imagine that, that as soon as they heard the breaking news, some of these guys were already uploading the Bitcoin approval video that they'd previously done and only had to, to, to delete it and take it down before, in some cases, before the upload was even finished. Think about that. Question. Question, where do you get your news? Question yourself. All right. Now, um, that Bitcoin ETF, it's on again. It's off again. Yes, finally, we get clearance a day later. All right. Van Eck, the president of Van Eck Funds, is on mainstream media. And, he's, and he, actually, he actually beat the news sources because he knew. That was a good news source. When the president of Van Eck Funds comes on live and says, I'm happy to, to say to everyone that the SEC is approving, all right, approving not one B Bitcoin ETF, but several, I believe it was 11 is what I heard, 11 Bitcoin ETFs. He trumped news. And I'm going to go with that guy because the last thing in the world that the president of, one of, of several of the largest ETF funds out there, the last thing he's going to do is get it wrong. He already knew the answer. He knew the answer. He let everybody know. And then, a few, and, then and, and, and everybody's waiting. And I'm watching Bitcoin and it's not moving again yesterday. And I'm thinking, <laughs> nobody, nobody wants to believe anyone anymore. In fact, it took later in the evening before Bitcoin started moving higher. And that was on Wednesday afternoon, right? And then Bitcoin further started to move a little bit higher again on Thursday. Uh, I mean, we passed 49, <clears throat> we passed 49,000 on Thursday. So obviously, um, the news is out now. Everybody has digested it. Where do we go from here? I'm actually going to do a video on this next week of where we go from here and the research that I've pulled down because <clears throat> you're going to want to hear about the multiplier effect. You're going to want to hear about scarcity and where <clears throat> what I believe uh, scarcity is in, in Bitcoin because I think it's a lot worse than everybody uh, has it out there. <clears throat> and what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, folks, is I'm talking about the amount of Bitcoin is lost that will never be recovered because it ended up in a landfill in some person's old computer or hard drive that they forgot about. Like that poor Australian bloke who um, apparently lost maybe a billion dollars in Bitcoin because someone in his family threw out the wrong hard drive that he had uh, all this Bitcoin on. And he's had people sifting through landfills trying to find it. I'm sorry to say it's probably gone. It's probably gone. That poor guy. Uh, so, you know, um, I'm still cautiously optimistic, all right, uh, for Bitcoin 
to break above and get above 50. Once we get above 50, I think things are going to look really good. I do think that we're going to see some volatility, and I believe it's going to happen over this three-day holiday we have coming up. All right? And the reason why is because the stock market's closed. All the talking heads are, are, are gone away for a three-day weekend. And when does Bitcoin make some of its biggest moves up or down? It does it when the markets are closed. All right? So, there you go. Um, you know, last week I talked about a $6 cup of coffee. You guys remember that? Man, I got a few comments on that one. Uh, everything from, from Great Stuff, which was our first podcast, uh, our first audio podcast of 2024, to what was somebody saying? I was out of touch with the cost of things. <laughs> I'm out of touch without the, with the cost of things. Uh, and, and you know what, that very well may be right because <clears throat> I'm not, I don't go out a lot, you know, um, I, uh, give you an idea. Okay. I live outside of Sarasota and there was a, a McDonald's that popped in and got, and, and was, um, you know, the area I live in, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of popping up. Um, slim chickens popped up. That's disgusting. Uh, it, it, my opinion. Okay. No, that, that's not, that's not an unbiased opinion. That's the Tom Gentile biased opinion. Uh, their chicken pops when you crunch on it. Ugh. Uh, at least this place did. Um, what else? Um, there was a Panda Express that popped up and, and then now most recently McDonald's has, uh, put their flag in the sand of the place near I live. And so, you know, I always think if you're going to eat at these places, go to them when they first open because you got the big, the train of trainers there, the quality controls there. So, you know, if, if you really want to try these places out, get them in the first two weeks they're open because after that, um, you know, these guys all pack up and leave and they leave the franchisee to deal with the, the store afterwards in, in many cases. Um, but, you know, I just, I, I look at that and I'm like, you know, like the $6 cup of coffee. And I'm like, wow, who would spend this? And I, I get it. It's convenient. But, you know, I mean, there is something to be said for prepping. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to teach my, my boys this. All right. So I've got, uh, I've got kids that really do value the dollar. And then I've got kids who, 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 overlook the dollar to value convenience. And then at the end of the year, they're, you know, half of them have money in their pockets and half of them are trying to figure out where it all went. And I'm telling them where it all went is on all these little conveniences that they've done. Now, there's a reason I'm getting into this, folks. You know, you got to be saying, hey, hey why, why is Tom talking about this so much? I, I'm talking about sacrifice. I'm talking about sacrifices. That $6 cup of coffee adds up. Uh, you know, I mean, when's the next time I, uh, that I'm going to go out and get a $6 cup of coffee? I'll tell you. You know, I mean, conveniences, for me, conveniences are I'm at the airport. And I'm, and I'm at the airport and I'm not coming home. I'm at the airport and I'm in some city I don't live in. And I need a cup of coffee. I can't just brew one myself. Yeah, I'm going to go to a Starbucks. I'm going to go to a Dunkin' Donuts. I'm going to go somewhere and get a cup of coffee, and I'm going to check that price and go, wow. Uh, but that that's convenience at the time. Um, but you know what? There are two sacrifices. In my mind, there are two big sacrifices in order to be a successful trader. And, you know, I mean, think about this. And 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 I'm I'm talking to the experience that's listening to the podcast. You and I both know trading does not come without some kind of price. If you've got money, then money is not as big a deal as time, all right? Knowledge and experience. Time, knowledge, and experience are those things you cannot buy. You can't buy time. We're all stuck in, an, you know, time is, uh, think about this, you know, who said it? Everyone said it. I remember it best on the movie Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, who said time is the one commodity, is, is, the, is, is, is one of the, is if not the biggest commodity, the most expensive commodity we have because you can't replace it. Once it's gone, it's gone. 
Um, but, you know, knowledge and experience, you need knowledge in order to trade the markets. I find a lot of people just, you know, uh, the, the lazy trader will learn as little as possible to get to the point to start trading. And then maybe experience will teach them that they need to learn more. That happened to me. All right. I'm not this, you know, I, I, I didn't come out of the gates doing everything right, folks. I was the lazy trader at first. I mean, imagine this. You know, you go to the dentist and you need some root canal. And the guy that's working on your mouth, well, he, he, learned, root, he learned dentistry from a book 24 hours ago. And now he's got you on the, uh, on the chair. You know, you're in the chair. You got the happy gas, so you can't get out of the chair. Now he's working on your mouth. Do you really want somebody working on your mouth that just learned it from a book? Or from a YouTube video 24 hours ago? No. But yet, trading has the least amount of barrier to actually doing it. I mean, you can, you can say, hey, I want to be a trader today. As soon as you get your account open, you're a trader. But are you a successful trader? In most cases, no. It's not going to be that easy. So knowledge, time, experience are things that, that you need, right? Um, you know, I say time and money, but it's not necessarily in that order for most people because most people want to be traders to add a second income or to build wealth. And, you know, and so you got to think about that. I think I think people, you know, that simply will not invest any time in their education, the markets are doomed to fail. And about every 10 years, we see a flock of them come and go. All right. Where did they come and go this year? In the meme stocks. Because everybody started hearing about it. I mean, it was a perfect storm. You know, you had COVID that kept people home. You had stimulus checks that came in. And all of a sudden you got this money that that just was a gift to you. And then what am I going to do with this money? A lot of people saved it, but a lot of people had it. As, as disposable income, it started hearing about all the great money that could be made um, on meme stocks, you know, getting getting those hedge funds, sticking it to them. <laughs> oh, those hedge funds came back. Guess who ended up winning? The, they may have lost the battle, but they won the war. The hedge fund traders won the war because if you take a look at GameStop and you take a look at AMC and you take a look at Bed Bath & Beyond, I mean, you know, that that you take a look at those three stocks. Look who won the war. If you haven't, if you haven't taken a look at them in a long time, do it. Do yourself a favor. Put yourself in the shoes of the meme trader and say to yourself, I am not going to do that. All right. If you're not going to do that, you're not going to be the lazy trader. You're not going to be the person that says, I think something's going to go up because this guy over here on YouTube said it. And oh, by the way, oh, he was a construction worker last year. Now he's a YouTube sensation. Oh, he must be right. All right. Um, no, we don't want to do that, folks. Rules-based trading. That is what I do. Okay. That is what I invite you to do. A rules-based trader is going to back. They're going to back their buy or sell with data, with what I call quantifiable data. That's data you can back test. All right. The rules-based trader knows how often the pattern that he or she is going to take, all right, how often it worked. They're going to know how well it did when they were right. That's called a run-up. They're going to know how bad it did when they were wrong. That's called a drawdown. They're going to know the average time in the trades. They're going to know all of this stuff before they put the trade on. And they're also going to know that this isn't a guarantee. But you know what? If you go into the markets with a little bit of knowledge, you're going to far exceed over the long run the person that knows nothing. All right? Some knowledge that you should already know. Markets go up more than they go down. So guess what? About 70% of the time, you're going to want to lean to the long side. And about 30% of the time, you're going to want to lean to the, to the short side. And then there are stocks you know, in, that go down in the bull market. There are stocks that go up in a bear market. 
There is, you know, where where do you want to be? Uh, do you want to be a a trader that just goes that's just a bullish trader? Well, if you do, you better be doing that in a bullish market. Luckily, um, probability is on your side long term. But you get inside the 30 day window, you know, that 30, 60, 90 day area. Markets could you could be getting into a market to go in either direction. The longer time frame trader you are, the more you want to be leaning to the bullish side. I mean, time, decades of time have shown us this. So we talk about, you know, the 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 one off trade. The one off trade is a coin flip. All right. So if I had if I were going to put my money with either a thinker an emotional-based trader or a rules-based trader, I'm going to go with the rules-based trader every time because one has a plan and one doesn't. So these are some things that you have to think about. All right? Now, what about money? Because money is a big one. Money is a big one that people seem to just, um, uh, you, you know, this, is, this, is, this happens for most people, money. You need money to trade with. Where do I get money to trade with? Now, I'm going to go down an area where some of you are going to you are going to be saying, yeah, this isn't for me. I don't need this. But then some of you are because here, you know, I kind of go back to some of my kids, a couple of my kids, and they say, oh, I, I wish I had more money to trade with because we're tra we're kind of a trading family. We're all talking about stocks all the time. And um, I'm not one of those parents that's just going to hand money to anybody. To any of my kids, it doesn't work that way. I worked hard and they should too, right? I studied the markets. I took my lumps. They should too. At, but, you know, when you're, you're going out and you're spending $6 a day on a Starbucks latte, that's, you know what, folks, that's $1,400 a year and that's five days a week, okay? That's, that's a typical work week. What about lunch? You know, what about lunch? Lunch out? I mean, man, you're talking lunch is $15, $20 a day now. It's not, you know, when I was a kid and I went out, uh, lunch might have been five bucks. Of course, we were making a lot less back then in the 80s. But lunch was $20 a day. I, You know, I remember um, when I went to New York, the first become a trader. I was eating out like a dummy. And you know what I did? I had a budget. My budget was 20 bucks for dinner. You know what you could get for 20 bucks for dinner in Manhattan? Not much. Uh, I was eating appetizers. I was eating nachos with beef. I was eating beef nachos. I, I can kind of remember the place that I got these from. But that was because it was the cheapest thing that would fill my belly at the time. So, uh, you know, I, I look at that and I'm like, okay, lunch out twenty dollars a day. You know what? That's five. That's fifty seven hundred dollars a year versus prepping at home. All right, here's one. You know, I'm talking about. I mean, to me, food is not a want; it's a need. So, yeah, you could take that number and, and, and drop that down quite a bit. I mean, the amount of, of, of money, you know, $480 a month, for instance, for lunch, that's, that's three meals a day if you, if you, and you don't even really have to, uh, to um, uh, coupon cut for that. Now, I'm getting this from the boss, all right? My information is I'm looking at it, I'm researching it online, but I'm getting it verified by the boss. You know who the boss is? Boss is my wife who knows these things. Now, here's a want. Okay, I'm going to throw some wants at you now. I mean, the Starbucks latte, that's a want. Because I can tell you right now, I make my own espressos on a machine. They're 33 cents a piece. I added it up. I got one. I just finished one now before the podcast. 33 cents. So what's a want? You know what? Here's some wants that a lot of... Um, a lot of the uh, Gen Z is doing cigarettes, not so much cigarettes anymore. Everybody's into vaping. You know, vaping, that stuff's not cheap. 
That's about that varies. But let's throw a hundred dollars a week on that one. That's about forty eight hundred dollars a year for the vapor that decided that the latte isn't enough stimulant. I need something else to stimulate myself during the day, after lunch, in the evening. Um, <laughs> here's a good one. And I mean, think about this. This is this is for everybody. How many of you have the following entertainment subscriptions? Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, YouTube Premium, Disney Plus, Paramount. And oh, now, you know, especially during the... Um, the holidays, or not during the holidays, during the winter months, got to have that peacock. You know why? Because of NFL, because of sports games. We have to have that too. Um, Apple TV, Amazon Prime TV. And you know what? We have Amazon Prime, but you know what? They, that, that's, a, that's kind of a misleader. Oh, yeah, Amazon Prime includes all these videos. You go to watch Amazon Prime, and there's not much on there that you can actually get. In my mind, it's good for free. Got to pay for got to pay for the premium stuff. Um, NFL sports package, and this doesn't even include cable TV, which, by the way, is phasing out. I mean, we we see it, but um, I still have cable. But uh, I mean, think about this: all this stuff I just talked about. You know what? This is all. Uh, here's 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 some stats. All right, average family has four subscription services that run about $60 a month. There's $720 right there. What about phone apps? How many of you have phone apps? I do. What do I have for phone apps? Looks like I got about $20 a month in my phone apps. Okay. Um, what are my phone apps? You know, I, I got to look again. I got to look again. And, you know, it took me a while to figure out where these were. And I, by the way, I actually ended up canceling a couple of phone apps that I was looking at here. So uh, under subscriptions, what do I have? Oh, I have RoboKiller. Got to have that one. That's a yearly subscription. I have Skype. That's a monthly. I have YouTube Premium. Um, but I used to have a whole bunch of different apps. Police Scanner, and I had... Um, I had uh, Apple News. I turned Apple News off because you know what? Most of the news you can get on Apple News where they keep you behind that paywall, you go out and Google it, you can find it. You can find that those most of those. Anyway, where am I going with all this? There is probably, I would say, ten to $15,000 on the list per year of stuff that I just talked about. Okay, let's say it's 15. Even if you give away 10, there's $10,000 right there that can immediately fund your trading account. So sacrifice. In order to be a trader, you have to have money, right? Where are you going to get it from? You can find money. Finding money is not hard uh, if you work, all right? Uh, it's just, it's, it, I call it lifestyle inflation. Lifestyle inflation is as you make more money, you tend to spend more. Right, so pull back on some of that lifestyle inflation and give yourself a chance for a future. Time, knowledge, experience. That's things that you can't just whip up. Right. You know, when I when I blew my account out in 1987, I took basically took a year off because guess what? I needed everything. I needed money. You know, when you margin out and you owe the broker money. You got to pay them back. I owed my broker $5,000 back in 1987, at the end of 87. My broker called me on a regular. Where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? Sound like a loan shark. By the way, you know what I got out of that? Boy, if you want to have personalized service with your broker, get a margin call. Get a margin call where you owe them money. Yeah, they'll be in touch with you. You'll get personalized service. Um, but you know what? I needed something just as important as money. I needed knowledge because I knew nothing. I needed experience. I needed knowledge. I needed time and experience in that order. And these things all, they don't come to you right away. So those are, those are the pieces that I wanted to put together for sacrifice, folks. So think about that, you know, as you're... Um, as you're getting more involved in this business, right? And I hope to, over time, through videos, through articles, 
and through podcasts, talk a little bit about the knowledge and experience that I have so that maybe some of that will rub off of on you in one way or another. That's my plan. All right, that's my plan. It is January. January is one of those, you know, this, that, it's, the, it's the month of resolutions. So let's resolve to get to clean out our, the, the closet in our head as traders and, uh, and, and come to this table with no bad habits. Okay. I think I told you last week uh, that I decided to stop sugar. Here we are. Um, I'm, you know, it's, I'm almost halfway through the month and I'm still sugar free. Not, there's sugar in everything. I know. I know I'm going to get that. But I'm talking about the stuff that you could see, the processed sugar, the stuff you could flip over on the, on, uh, you know, that, that's, if it's one gram of sugar, I, I can't avoid that because that's going to be in many foods. Um, but if it's candy, if it's chocolate, if it's cakes, if it's, if it's that crap, I've, if it's soda, I got rid of all that. I got to tell you, last week was tough. It, you know, last week was tough. It's getting easier for me. Um, I, you know, dare I say some of the benefits I'm getting out of it? I'll save that for another podcast. Uh, before I leave you, I, you know, and I still got a few minutes here that, that I want to discuss this. I don't want to just run out the door here, but... You know, uh, last week we had a recent storm. We had our first storm. We had a recent storm, first storm of the year. Uh, Finn, they called it, what did they call it? They just called it Weather Storm Finn, F-I-N-N. -N. Uh, came knocking on our door, and most of the East Coast got a whiff of Finn. Now, in Florida, Finn was tornadoes. Finn was wind that was 60, 70 mile an hour gusts. That was without the tornadoes. And Finn was a lot of rain. So here's what was going on. Here we are. I prepped before Finn. What I meant was I put away everything that wasn't nailed down outside. And then I forgot, but I forgot about something. I forgot about patio furniture. Now, you know, patio furniture, I have cushion patio furniture. All right, the cushions were already in the garage. Somehow I forgot the um, the wicker, you know, that plastic wicker. And here I am, and the winds are already starting to pick up. I see the umbrellas. I forgot the umbrellas, too, the patio umbrellas. And they're already popping up. I, I cranked them down. The wind cranked them back up and actually took one of them towards, um, towards the back door. So I run outside. I'm like, I can't possibly get all this stuff. I got no room in my garage. So uh, umbrellas, I put them down. You know what I did with the furniture? I threw it in the pool. This is a lot of furniture. I threw all the all the chairs, um, the, the, the recliners, the ottomans, all of that stuff went in the pool. <laughs> in my mind, the wind wasn't going to get to it when it sunk to the bottom of the pool. But you know what the other benefit I got of it? Got cleaned. <laughs> It got cleaned because of the, you know, that uh, bleach. Uh, I mean, I have a saltwater pool, but uh, let's let's face it. It's 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 only salt water because I throw salt in it and the salt gets converted into um, into bleach. I call it organic bleach. Anyway, the the the, uh, the chairs got cleaned a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, prepping. Just like you prep for a storm. What's going on in the markets right now? Do we need to prep for a storm in the markets? Maybe. I want all of you, when you get a chance, you know, we I do a long, I do a long look at the markets. I look at the stock market with SPY. I look at the bond market. I look at TLT. I look at uh, our cash, U.S. dollar. That's I look at UUP. I look at USO and GLD as commodities. But you know what you could also look at? There is two symbols that you could look at to get an idea what the overall market, what the option traders are telling you is happening in the markets. And I was looking at VIX and VXX. It's funny because when I looked at VIX, VIX is at some really interesting lows right now, folks. I have not seen lows on VIX like this. I mean, you go back. VX, v, the VIX has not been this low 
since pre-COVID. And there's this old saying that, I mean, it dates all the way back to when I was on the America Stock Exchange. When I was working at the America Stock Exchange, it said, um, when the VIX is low, it's time to go. When the VIX is high, it's time to buy. What does that mean? When the VIX is high, it's time to buy. It means that when the VIX is high, there's fear. There's 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 this this pent up fear that's going on, um, and fear makes people do things they shouldn't do, and there and fear is making people sell everything at any price, and that's the time to be a buyer of the stock market. So when the VIX is high, it's telling you that the markets are you know are um, moving lower, possibly in a free fall, and if you step up and be a buyer, that over the long term you will be right. When the VIX is low, it's time to go. That means when the VIX is super, super low, there's a lot of complacency happening. Everybody thinks that the market is just going nowhere but up. And that's the time to really start thinking about protection. You know, how do you prepare for a financial storm? Well, it's simple. You reduce your exposure, which, you know, like I say, I, I like to say I'm cautiously optimistic, but I reduced my exposure in my longer term accounts. Um, I'm in bonds in a lot of my longer term accounts because they're paying. They're paying like they haven't in quite some time. Um, but also you could balance as a trader. You could balance your long and shorts. You can balance your bulls and your bears. You know, if you have if you have strategies that are picking bulls for you, you should also have strategies that are picking bears for you too. So you can balance yourself out when things are really this, when the VIX is cheap, when the VIX is low, it also means option prices are very cheap when you look at the range of where they've been on the low side and on the high side. The cheapest that I've seen us was uh, December, just, just a month ago, December. And the last time we were this cheap, it was December 2019, all right? Five years ago. Now, I'm not predicting COVID's coming or anything like that. COVID comes every year now. But what the VIX is telling us is the market's getting soft. So I'm just throwing it out there for you guys, all right? There we go. Thank you all very much for hanging out with me and listening to this podcast. You have comments, put them in wherever you can. Share them with me. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think about uh, yourself as a trader. Tell me where you think about Bitcoin. Where, you, where do you think Bitcoin's going? All right. And tell me what you think about this market that's going on in January. I'd like to hear from you. And uh, be ready because I'm gonna actually going to do a video this coming week. All right, this coming week, we got a long holiday weekend ahead of us. Three-day weekend here in the States, Martin Luther King Day. All right, and so during the long holiday weekend, I'm going to dot my I's, I'm going to cross my T's, and I'm going to put together a video on cryptocurrency and where I see things going and why. All right, so have yourself a great extended holiday weekend. I'll be back next week. We'll see you then. Bye, everyone.